Hey friends, welcome back as we continue with chapter eight. Chapter eight is titled, The Storm Breaks. In spite of threatenings and rumors at home, the blessing continued to spread abroad. I had been enjoying the new freedom in the Lord for about three weeks when a call came from the Episcopal chaplain at one of the large universities in the Los Angeles area. I just have to talk to you, Dennis, he said. I hardly know you, but I had an experience last night that's really shaken me up. He proceeded to describe, almost point for point, an encounter with the Holy Spirit exactly like my own, including the fact that as he began to praise the Lord in the new language, he saw a vivid picture of Jesus on the cross. Another minister's life was touched, this time as a result of the Holy Spirit working through a child. Don and Shirley were among the first to be baptized in the Holy Spirit at St. Mark's. One day, Shirley said to me, I've got something to tell you, Father Bennett. You know Chris, our, our six-year-old? I nodded. Well, the first part of this year, we were baffled at what to do about him. He was the terror of the first grade. Not a day went by, it seemed, without our getting a call from the school that Chris had been sent to the office or was in hot water of some kind. The teacher said he was just uncontrollable. She paused and then looked at me with a twinkle in her eye. Don and I had an idea what to do about it, she continued. The baptism in the Holy Spirit had helped us so tremendously. Why shouldn't this experience help Chris? Shirley saw the concern on my face and went on. Now, don't get excited, Father Bennett. It's all right. Honest it is. We sat Chris down and we told him what had happened to us and asked if he would like to have Jesus baptize him in the Holy Spirit. He said he would, so he prayed, and he began to speak in tongues almost immediately. He laughed happily and then ran off to play. Really, Shirley, I remonstrated, this isn't a toy for children. Listen to the rest of the story, she said firmly. Several school days later, I got a phone call from Chris's teacher. What in the world has come over Chris, she asked me. This week has been my best pupil. He hasn't made any trouble at all, and he's so happy. It's amazing. I told her what had happened, and she said, I'll be right over. I need that too. And you know what, Father Bennett? She came over and received the Holy Spirit. I was speechless as Shirley finished her story. And do you know who she is? She asked me. I shook my head. She's the wife of the assistant minister at one of the Lutheran churches. He's coming over to find out what it's all about, too. We want you to be here to help us explain it all to him. The young minister was interested in his wife's experience. She had been a doubting Christian, almost an agnostic, so much so that the senior pastor and the leaders of the church had been questioning her fitness to be a pastor's wife. Her sudden acquisition of a truly radiant faith could not fail to impress them, and it all came about because of the change in one small child. While many such good things were taking place, the gulf of misunderstanding at the church continued to widen. My policy of keep quiet and hope for the best was definitely not working. The opposition was not directed at me personally, but the very small group of people who were stirring up the trouble were convinced that I had gone off the track and their mission was to bring me back to my senses. For several months, I tried to hold the church together by the compromise of silence on my part but this simply gave the dissenters opportunity to work at sowing seeds of discontent. It was a strange time. I was upset by the growing attacks, yet I was enjoying God's blessing in a new dimension. Quite early in the game, I had learned something of the peace of the Holy Spirit, and I learned it in a traffic jam. Our daughter was scheduled to come home from college in San Jose, California for the Thanksgiving holiday, and the rest of the family was en route to the Los Angeles International Airport to meet her. It was a hot, sticky, smoggy afternoon as we parked the car and walked toward the flight arrivals of the little local airline. I realized that ocean fog was rolling in to join forces with the smog and that the airport was rapidly getting socked in. An announcement over the public address system soon confirmed my fears. My daughter's flight had overflown Los Angeles because of the weather and was on its way to Burbank. We trudged back to the car. This time, as we drove north, the boulevard was jammed. 
the industrial plants that cluster around the airport were releasing their workers and the traffic was bumper to bumper. The air was hotter than ever with plenty of fresh exhaust fumes to add a little extra punch to the smog. And it would be a good hour and a half to Burbank. At the airport, I had elbowed my way to the ticket counter and pleaded with the harried attendant to page my daughter when her flight arrived and to tell her to wait at Burbank for us. The airline clerk's preoccupied manner had not convinced me that he would remember to do it. Yet, as we inched our way along, I was not tense. I wasn't gripping the wheel with sweaty palms, muttering exclamations of impatience, or giving opinions about the slowness and the stupidity of the other drivers. I was singing. I caught myself at it, singing a hymn. And I felt cool and calm way down inside. I thought to myself, I feel peaceful. I don't understand why. Quick as a flash, the Holy Spirit said in my heart, of course you don't. This is the peace that passes understanding. The next time I saw John and Joan, I said, you didn't tell me about the peace that passes understanding. Oh, did you just discover it? John replied. He was as objective as if, as if he and I had bought identical automobiles and I had said to him, I didn't realize that the car would come equipped with air conditioning. And he had replied, oh, did you just discover that on yours too? We retrieved Margie safely from the Lockheed Air Terminal in Burbank. And on the next day, Thanksgiving day, I had the rare experience of sitting with my family in the congregation of my own church. One of my assisting ministers was conducting the service. As I listened to the familiar words of the Book of Common Prayer and the reading of the scripture lesson, I was suddenly overwhelmed by the beauty and significance of it. For the first time in my life, to my remembrance, I was moved to tears by a church service. The Holy Spirit did not just enhance for me the worship of my own denomination, but he showed me the significance of others. A short time later, I had my first experience of speaking to a group of Pentecostal ministers. Six months earlier, I would have hesitated to address an assembly of Methodists or Presbyterians lest I compromise my Anglo-Catholic position. I didn't know what to expect, although I had already found out that Pentecostals were very different from the Holy Roller caricature. I respected them because I knew from my research that these were the Christians who had preserved the understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit sometimes in the face of real persecution, and I owed them gratitude for the blessing that had come into my own life. The setting of the, meet the meeting was unfamiliar. The form of worship was totally different from that used in the Episcopal Church, and the people were strangers to me. Yet, as they began to sing and praise and pray, I knew these were my brothers in the Lord. Not because of any official connection, for we had none, but because I felt the wonderful thing the scripture calls the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. My talk to the ministers was well accepted. I was amazed at the strength of the bond between us and the Lord. Few of these good men had what my church would consider adequate theological training, but I had more than an inkling that they were my superiors in the training that matters knowing the Lord and his ways. After my testimony, one of the men on the platform asked permission to speak. As I listened, in my spirit, I knew that the speaker was not sharing his own thoughts with us, but wisdom that God was giving. Father Bennett, we would love to have you join us, and there will always be a welcome for you in our churches, but we know this is not the thing for you to do. You should stay in your own denomination so that they can receive the word uh, receive word of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, for they will listen to you where they would not listen to us. These words confirmed what I had already known in my heart, but it was surely the wisdom of God to underline the fact so well that day. Had he not, on the following day, I might not have been quite so sure. That night, as I knelt to say my prayers, my thoughts turned to the situation at the parish, which, would, would have, which had been growing steadily more unbearable. I was burdened with a heavy load of anxiety and fear. I felt like a drinking glass into which had been poured two different liquids, light and heavy. 
the fire and joy of the Holy Spirit were there, undiminished, deep in my heart, but they were overlaid and oppressed by fear and anxiety. My experience with the Pentecostal ministers, free and rejoicing in the Holy Spirit, had stirred my spirit. As I began my prayers, the joy of the Holy Spirit in me suddenly gained power and bubbled over my new language. I could not stop praising God. I had praised him and praised him. And as I did so, I had an inner vision of the Almighty on his heavenly throne, surrounded by hosts of creatures, earthly and heavenly, praising him and glorifying him. I could hardly stop praising. What was even more glorious was that the praise went on through my dreams all night long. God had prepared me well for what was coming the next day, Sunday, April 3rd. On that Passion Sunday in 1960, I did what I should have done five months before. The Holy Spirit had at last got the point through to me. I'm not asking you to hold this church together. I'm asking you to tell what has happened to you. This isn't your church anyway. It belongs to Jesus. I set aside the preaching scheduled for the day and I went into the pulpit at the three morning services and simply shared what had happened to me. I appealed to the people to dismiss the ridiculous rumors. The general reaction was open and tender until the end of the second service. At that point, my second assistant snatched off his vestments, threw them on the altar and stalked out of the church crying, I can no longer work with this man. That blew the lid off. After the service concluded outside on the patio, those who had set themselves to get rid of the movement of the Holy Spirit began to harangue their arriving and departing parishioners. One man stood on a chair shouting, throw out the damn tongue speakers. Fortunately, even the most distressing events can have their humorous side. That morning in the midst of the tumult and the shouting, one little lady at least was blissfully unaware. <laughs> As she shook hands with the greeter at the door, she murmured, it was a lovely service. <laughs> the contrast was amazing. On one hand was the un unreasoning fury of the opposition. While the people who had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit were quietly moving around, telling their story, faces shining with the love of God. They were pleased somehow, in spite of the confusion, that at last they were free to witness openly. As for me, I was appalled. This unexpected crisis was one too many. When one of my vestrymen, a leader of the opposition, came to me and said bluntly, you should resign, I was ready to do so. I am often asked the question, why didn't you hang on and fight it out? The truth is I didn't have to leave. There is no way to force an Episcopal rector to resign against his will as long as he is not guilty of any moral or canonical offense. And even then he's entitled to a trial. But I was tired of being put on the spot. I knew that the little group that had aligned themselves against me would fight me to the death and it could easily turn into a court battle with much unfortunate publicity. It didn't seem to be the best way to proclaim the good news. In addition, I had a strong need to think it over. A lot had happened to me in a fairly short period of time. I did not feel that I completely understood it all. If I had the knowledge and the background of the whole matter that I have now, things might have been different, but I didn't. I wanted to take inventory, to sit down quietly somewhere and think and pray about it. So it was with relief that I said to the vestryman, okay, I'll resign right away. At the 11 a.m. service, I announced my resignation to, the, to an astonished and distressed congregation and I walked away from the parish that I had served for seven years. When I came home that memorable, 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 <laughs> memorable Passion Sunday, I found my wife waiting for me, her eyes shining. Dennis, she said, it was wonderful. We got to tell so many people what was really happening. At that moment, I didn't share her enthusiasm. I was still too shocked by the morning's events. But later I began to realize the truth of her words. The phone and the doorbell began to ring as people came by to ask the question, what is it all about? We suddenly found ourselves free to talk. That night there was a real air of impending victory when 75 enthusiastic Christians met for prayer and praise. 
They felt that if enough people at the church received the power of the Holy Spirit and found how beneficial it is, the parish might yet be united. Many people from St. Mark's and elsewhere came and many were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Contrary to popular report, there was no split at St. Mark's. The opposition group was actually very small. The majority of the church had no idea what had hit them. My only dispute with those who created the furor at St. Mark's was that they really did not investigate carefully, but rather acted from prejudice and hearsay, a very human thing to do indeed. I didn't know what to do next, but I just tried to follow the Lord one step at a time. God continued to do great things. Louise, who is 83 years old, had been suffering from ten, for 10 years from a painful arthritis of the spine and angina of the heart. She was forced to keep to her bed most of the time. I had often called her at her little home. Louise had friends who had received the Holy Spirit, and one day, shortly after the blow up at St. Mark's, she said to me, I believe all this is happening. I believe that all of this is happening is real. And I know too, if you lay your hands on me, Father Bennett, I will be healed. I laid my hands on her head and I asked God to heal her. I do not remember that I personally felt much confidence. In fact, I left the room after praying for her without even asking if she felt any better. About a week later, when I saw her at a prayer meeting, I asked, how are you, Louise? She replied, I'm fine, of course. Later that week, she came to our house and skipped around the front room. See what I can do, she chortled. A year after her healing, she wrote me a note saying she was still feeling just fine. She added that one evening her neighbor, 72 years of age, had locked herself out of her house. She's a bit crippled up, Louise said, so I climbed in the window and let her in. But I do get a bit tired sometimes, she said. Three weeks after my resignation on April 25th, the traditional feast of St. Mark, it seemed fitting that those of us who had been meeting regularly for prayer should fast and pray for the parish and its future. At the end of the day, we all met at the rectory and began by reading the evening lessons from the common book of prayer. Oh, I said, as I looked in the lectionary, which is the list of daily Bible readings in the front of the common book of prayer, the Old Testament lesson is from the Apocrypha. And I don't have a, a copy of the Apocrypha here, so I'll pick another reading instead. Can't you get an Apocrypha from your office? Inquired one of the women. I think we ought to read the lessons as they are appointed. It seems important somehow. I found an Apocrypha and I turned to the evening lesson. It was from Ecclesiasticus 51, 13 to 22. Everyone listened dutifully as I read the first part of the lesson, which was a typical piece of wisdom literature, poetic, but not too exciting. I read the 21st verse. My heart was troubled in seeking her wisdom. Therefore, I have gotten a good possession. Then as I read the 22nd verse, there was sensation. The Lord hath given me a tongue for my reward, and I will praise him therewith. How could the Holy Spirit have known and guided the, comp the compilers of that lectionary many years before to select a lesson for St. Mark's Day that would come through with such meaning to this little group of Christians? Marvelous are the ways of God. In amazement, we began to praise him. Many spiritually hungry people came to talk about and pray for the power of the Holy Spirit, which would enable them to live more effective Christian lives. We met in private homes. Since I was no longer rector of the parish, as an Episcopal priest, I would have been viol violating canon law had I held public meetings. The authorities interpreted our actions as un- Canonical, I can't even pronounce this word. Uncanonical, anyway. <laughs> Uncanonical, <laughs> tongue twister. It was soon clear that if I continued, I might not be able to remain in the Episcopal ministry. I could not forget the words of wisdom from the minister at the Pentecostal rally that I was needed in my own denomination. We wrestled with various thoughts of what to do next. I began to investigate what other leaders of the Episcopal Church thought about this renewing experience of our faith. Madeline, the church librarian, was an old friend of the then presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, the late Bishop Lichtenberger, or Lichtenberger. At her urging, he invited me to come and talk with him. I flew to San Antonio, Texas, and unfolded my story. 
and must have talked for more than an hour while he listened patiently and attentively and with obvious interest. When I finished, he said, Dennis, there's nothing wrong with this. It's wonderful, but you know, I don't have any authority to, to help you with your local situation. Even so, his interest and kindness encouraged me to carry my investigation further. Later in the month, a priest of the diocese, a friend of mine who had been quite interested in what was going on in my life, returned from a conference in the San Francisco area and said to me, you know, Dennis, I shared your story with the bishops from Seattle and Portland, and they are not closed to your experience. Why don't you go and see them? I determined to do just that. I had had some contact with both of these men before, and when I wrote them, each said he would be happy to talk with me.